I've been using the RP diet to fuel my weightlifting performance for years, and RP's simple, science-based approach has been instrumental to my success. With the new RP Diet app, following RP's principles is as easy as entering my goals and schedule and choosing my favorite foods. The app builds a diet to my exact needs, reminds me to eat my meals, and adapts to my body's changes every single day and week. The RP Diet app is a huge help in my quest to become the best athlete I can be, and if your goal is to be your best, it will help you. Folks, welcome back. I am slightly more clean cut Dr. James Hoffman. He is equally as clean cut as last time, I think. Dr. Mike Isratel, we are here to answer your questions on the YouTubes. Mike, how's it going? Good, how are you? Okay, dog's situation's a little bit better. I've actually gotten some sleep. Not Aww. a lot, how, how but some. How are they physically? They're, they, they, they grow at like an alarming rate. Like, uh, you know, we got them when they were like 10-ish pounds and now they're like 15 pounds. You know what I mean? So it's it's like literally I put on half your body weight in the matter of a few weeks. It's pretty (laughs) trippy. Actually, one of them has a problem. uh, The girl grew asymmetrically. Her back legs just fucking grew like out of nowhere and her rest of her body didn't really grow. So now she's having like a lot of joint laxity in her like dog whatever the equivalent of a dog knee is and you can see <laughs> it when she walks like her knee will displace in the wrong direction because her oh, back legs no. are too long and so yeah we've been kind of dealing with that but uh, they're good other than that there's a dog Poor there's a fast yeah there's a dog lady in my neighborhood like of all places there's like a lady who babysits dogs in houston montana so it's like it worked out great so we sent That's them to dog awesome. daycare yeah so what we've been doing is uh folks if you ever have puppies this is a, a brilliant way of managing your time uh, send them to do half days at doggy daycare and then you can just work and then come back and deal with the puppies later because when they're home all day it's just like pee 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 like never ending yeah. it just never and they socialize well with other dogs there so it's really good. yeah exactly so it's working out good and they have a lot of fun so. they do they have a ton um, all right so let's get started yeah let's do it up do you want to share or do you want me to share uh you can share and i'll uh i'll point okay all right. Let me know when you're ready. Ready to go. Let's start with Cass J. Top comment next to Milo. I would prefer it was Cas B, like Bill Kazmaier. That's right. He's like, hey, how come you guys are small and weak? Bill, we don't know. <laughs> how come you guys don't use metrics? <laughs> A very good question for all. So, all right. So, Casby says, "Hey, Mike, I had a question that I've wondered." You're keeping for a, while now. A, a counter, also. Oh yeah! Fuck! 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 Hold up! Hey. Uh, I can do. I can. Ha- I can do some hashes. Oh, uh, that's okay. Gotta, nope. uh, what the fuck did I do? My counter. There it is. Um, okay. So I'm. Uh, counter's open. All right. Here we go. So, hey, Mike, I've had a question I've wondered for a while now. I thought it might be a good one for your next q and I've been watching almost all lectures and trying to follow a device, but one subject so confuses me. So you told us in a lecture that you have to get between zero to five RIR to grow well. Some days you may be more fatigued, so it feels like one RIR might actually be a true three RIR on that day. So you'll still grow. It is what you said, which I... You mean that the get. other way around? It feels like one RIR, but might actually be a true, like at the muscular level, it's a true three RIR. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you also explained how you train where you go for a set of 18, one RIR. And after that, you drop down to 16, 12, even eight reps. And eight can feel like one RIR at the time due to fatigue and possible short rest. It's, it's not due to short rest, but it is due to fatigue. But it's actually a true 11 RIR, it's not. And then you state as long as it's above five reps, it works. But isn't that way you're sorry. Yeah. So you're assuming within the question that, um, that Mike could reproduce that same effort across all sets, given the same intensity constrictions, which fatigue prevents that from happening at at all. So. Yep. hundred percent. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, hey, a true 11 RIR. He, he literally meant 11 reps from failure. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then, as you state, as long as it's about five reps, it works. But isn't that a way of low stimul- stimulans intensity for one set 
to even work? And doesn't this go against everything you previously stated? Uh, okay, so let me just address this really quick. And James already did it in part. Um, when we say you train from zero to five RIR, and that's generally a good range, we generally mean uh, that we want the local muscle itself to generally be in that zero to five RIR. So we don't want systemic factors like systemic fatigue to limit you. So when your example is like some days you feel more fatigued, we're assuming that systemic fatigue. And then, yeah, your RIR might be off a little bit. When you're going set to set to set, uh, you should be resting enough for, by our four point checklist rest formula that systemic fatigue is not a major factor. And in addition to that, it also you totally actually don't need this the four point checklist for this because the limiting factor for fatigue from set to set to set is often just local. Okay, so if you come in tired, limiting factor could be systemic because your muscles are fine. It's just your brain and the rest of your body is tired. But after you do a really hard set, it, usually the limiting factor is pretty close to at least the actual muscle itself. And then when you hit the muscle again, that is really a, you know, one RIR because the muscle itself is fucked up and it really fatigued. So it is actually one rep away from failure at the muscular level which means it experiences all the benefits of faster motor unit recruitment, high levels of metabolites, increased pumps, so on and so forth. And there is nothing anywhere ever in the world that says you should be able to match your performance set to set to set. That is literal make-believe made up by people for just simplifying programs, three by 10. There's no reason to think that the amount of time it takes you to recover, to be able to do 10 reps again and again is the optimum time for hypertrophy or strength. Also, there's no reason to think you'll ever recover. So for example, when I did a true zero RIR effort back in the day at high bar squats, I did 500 for 10. It's on YouTube. Um, and my next set, I think I did uh, like five or three at 500, which That's was also zero RIR, but I yeah. rested five minutes. Okay, there's actually no amount of time short of a two week re re peaking that I could have hit another 10 at 500. So yeah. now that's not always the case. Or even, right? even close. Even, right. even like seven sure. or eight, even like seven. no way. Right, like that's how much that set took out of me. So there's no reason to assume that you can hit the same sets over and over and over. It's just no reason to assume that. And as long as systemic factors aren't the ones holding you back a ton, even if your muscle is fatigued locally, when you hit way fewer reps, if you truly push the muscle to close to local failure, that RIR estimate is accurate. Yeah, and just like a fun thought experiment, where do you draw the line as to what is a true RIR? So Mike already explained, all we're considering is the muscular level, but like, so if Mike did a peaking protocol for hack squats, for example, and then did like a two week taper so that he could have the best top set on hack squat that he's ever done ever, would that be the true IRR? And then reference Everything point- Everything else was true then before, like it was a wasted mesocycle, right? Exactly, so it's kind of like, where do you draw the line? And the, the, where, that line is essentially where the muscle is at the current time when you're training. And The muscle, it. not systemic factors, the muscle. If the muscle is truly being pushed close to failure. I'm frozen. I'm frozen and Dr. Mike's in a really funny face right now. I wish people could see what I could see. Can you hear me? I can hear you. There we go. Oh, sweet. Um, I, they probably will see the face because it gets recorded right to YouTube. Um. <laughs> you know what I might try? I'm kind of struggling today. I might just try and I wonder if I can just turn off my video. Actually, you know what? I'll, I'll mess with that another time. Let's okay. just keep going. All right. So, okay, let's get to the rest of his question. You also talked about junk volume, as in when you get so tired that the volume is above uh, uh, actual 6RAR and that it's barely worth it, should you go, you should better go home, rest, et cetera, and don't force more sets, which result in junk volume. But in that case, isn't most of your volume junk volume? It could, would be if a nervous system and uh, other se central systemic factors were limiting, but in that case, they're not. So it's all for the, the four part question. Uh, Cass J, uh, you should uh, search on YouTube or in, in the RP uh, Strength channel or Renthouse channel. Um, uh, how long to rest between sets in like hypertrophy made simple. And it's, it's going to answer all these questions for you. Um, and then he says, I got all this from your lectures and training videos. Uh, what you said seemed to contradict each other. So can you please explain to me? Cause I don't really seem to get it anymore. By the way, I mostly do like four by eight, nine, seven, seven example of zero set on my account with a weight I can do 11 times for a max. 
And then I go uh, up the volume and intensity, RIR goes down and I lower the reps, et cetera, per week for most compounds. Uh, sorry for the long question, possibly bad English. It's not my main language, dyslexia, ha ha. No worries. I would advise you against lowering the reps uh, week to week to week because it gives you a troubling time estimating the total effort you're exerting and you trouble estimating whether or not you're sufficiently recovered. So I would actually say to keep the rep stable week to week to week and just lower your RIR. And if you can no longer keep the rep stable to start to fall on you, then you're by definition underperforming relative to the last week. And you should probably deload. James, anything to add to that? Um, that was good advice. I'm just looking at what he wrote, the four by eight, nine, seven, seven. So if that is a zero RIR, there's some glaring issues for me. The first being that you probably aren't doing a very good warm up. Whenever you see someone's second set going up in reps, mm -hmm. usually that means that the first set was still effectively warming them up. Mm -hmm. So I would consider that. And uh, also, you might not be assessing zero RIR properly. So uh, aside from the warm up issue, like there's really no circumstance where you do a set with the zero RIR and your reps go up in the subsequent set. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's realistically, right? And even then, I would expect, let's say you just flip flopped the first two and did nine, eight, seven, seven. I would expect it to be more like nine, seven, six, five, something like that, where it, it, there's, you really shouldn't be able to hold on to your reps that hard when you're going at zero. Maybe if you're going one or two, that seems more normal, but at zero, no way. I marked that in the three. And. Let's go on to question number two, which is going to be from right below eruption 89. Almost asks, sounds sexual. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So just uh, two, two uh, integers in that first number away from hot 69 eruption. <laughs> Why do you suggest that intermediates should mainly use the five to 10 rep range and only 24 to 40% in the 10 to 20 range? with presumably none in the 20 to 30. Is it because maximizing fast twitch fiber growth? I understand that beginners need to master good technique and don't get fatigued enough to need the high, lighter rep ranges. Is there a problem with their immediate using more exercise in the 10, 20, 20, 30 rep ranges? Uh, Ruption, I believe that uh, I've, uh, James and I have always said that beginners should be in the five to 10 range primarily and that intermediates should be primarily in the 10 to 20, actually. I don't believe I, we ever said immediate. Yeah, I was wondering about that too. Yeah, I was like, I don't think we've ever said that. Yeah, simple, simple answer on that one. So we're gonna count that as done. Uh, it's good that we get to say stuff like this, though, like do, do these webinars and answer that because it's always good to, you know, to get, get out of the misconceptions. And let's face it, you and I say dumb shit all the time. So it's not totally. outside of the realm of possibility For that sure. we did say some For dumb sure. shit. Maybe we fucked up. <laughs> need to be clarified. Here's what we really meant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Let's go next right below to Frank Hudacek, who says, nice. hello, macho men is actively elevating the scapulas. <laughs> Scapulae. Scapulae. Don't you even Latin? <laughs> oh boy, this is gonna be one of those like paralysis analysis questions I feel it like coming yeah. on. Well, right, sorry, quick side note, Crystal and I started watching The Simpsons uh, on Hulu. And comic book guy was like in the first episode and I just started dying of laughter. Dude, he, I love comic book guy. He's the greatest character in any, I swear to God, he's my favorite character in any, anything ever, comic book guy. There, uh, for, for, for you listeners, when Mike and I were in Johnson City, we went to an airsoft store uh, just outside of Johnson City, and that guy literally exists in the real, in yes. the real world. Except he's bigger in the real world. He was <laughs> really <laughs> big. He was, he was really big. Oh, man, that was funny. Hello, macho men. Is actively engaging the scapulae, a.k.a. shrugging, at lockout and overhead press necessary, at least preferable to avoid impingement? I remember Mark Ripito saying this in a video, and this is how I learned to press. Do you, I have to do this? It does make the work a bit harder having to shrug hundreds of thousands of pounds overhead. Some up with your keys pointed to be fucked down, can risk. That's usually unlikely. Pressing overhead is a very impingement risk. Hugging, uh, decrease that risk, decrease that somewhat by a mechanism I'm not aware of uh, at any point, but it is does absolutely fuck up the stimulus to fatigue ratio of your overhead press. And I'll tell you that precisely uh, zero Olympic weightlifters do it. I mean, I don't know about zero, but less than 1%. Uh, they just press and so pretty much all strongman press and there's not like a spate of injuries there from impingement. So I think it's just five, you know, five, two boxes for, for shit Ripito says. 
box one is like fucking really spot on shit that's brilliantly put and super simple. And box two is like insane shit that he just makes up. Uh, that goes into box two as far as I'm concerned. James. Yeah, and it, I, I'm sorry, Mike, if I repeat anything that you said, I kind of got roboted out there for a little while. Um, but I don't know if there's any actual, you know, tangible safety mechanism built into that. And part two, um, you do naturally do that a little bit. If you've ever actually done a lot of overhead pressing, it's not uncommon for people to have sore delts and traps. And that's just a result of you naturally elevating your scapulas a little bit during the press. What I don't think you should do is spend a lot of time actively trying to like shrug up as you're pressing. That just seems like a ton of wasted effort. And I, I caught Mike saying at the end, uh, definitely going to screw up your stimulus to fatigue ratio on that movement. And I totally yeah. agree with that. It just seems silly because you're already going to do that a little bit as a natural part of the movement. So no need to accentuate the shrugging part. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. So um, let's move down a couple notches to the blue letter B bastion Ingerle. Got it. Hi, Docs. Thank you a lot for this format. Question for you. What's the best way to increase vertical jump height for a professional volleyball player Ooh. whose jumping technique is already perfect and who is generally well-trained and losing weight is not an option? Jump height is the sole focus. Volleyball training only once a week. Okay, volleyball training once a week is already a bad idea. We'll decide here and there. Time for improvement, three months. So how would a program look like for the next three months when the goal is only to increase vertical jump height, which exercises, volume, intensities, frequencies, periodization, et cetera. Looking forward to hearing from you. We're absolutely not going to answer this question in the level of depth that you would like because that writing a program out with words over YouTube is a little bit out of the scope of what you can do with human language. <laughs> um, hmm. It should be written. But James, can you give us the broad strokes, please, to send Bastion on his way with something else? Yeah, sure. So this is kind of a tough one because you're asking like in a very acute sense. And unfortunately, um, fortunately and fortunately, jumping is something that can benefit from like short term periodization strategies, but probably has the best benefit in the long term. So what I would say is generally you're going to take a long term approach for something like jumping. And the way that you would do that is by, as you already mentioned, learning how to jump properly. But strength is generally the best bang for your buck in terms of the moderate to long term jump improvements. Why? Because for the most part, most athletes are not limited by the power that they produce. They literally just don't produce enough force to get as much out of the jump or any kind of power related movement that they're doing. Um, so usually what we find is that you can take an athlete, like a volleyball player, for example, and if they're an intermediate level, and I know this person's already a professional, but just, just hear me out. Um, you can take an in, two intermediate athletes. You give one that's just like a more strength focused program, one that's a more power focused program. And by the end of, you know, three to five months, they're going to get roughly the same type of gains. And what we find is that strength is usually the limiting factor for most kind of intermediate level people in the long term. In the short term, you can actually mm -hmm. see some pretty rapid improvements in jumping ability by doing a lot of jump and power specific training. However, this is one of those things that tends to plateau extremely fast. So you can kind of eke out like a really big power benefit from doing some highly specific um, jump training. But that's one of those things where you're going to see it just after like one or two mesos kind of <laughs> really peak out. So that being said, you got three months. That's a pretty good amount of time to work. I would hope, you know, if you were, if, in a better situation, I would like to see that stretched out. Like, okay, we're trying to work on jump height for the next six months to a year. That would be something very, very tangible, very, very workable. Three months is kind of like, okay, we're just going to do the best that we can. First off, it depends on what you're trying to do with the jump. If it's volleyball specific training, uh, like volleyball specific jumping, I would actually just increase your volleyball uh, training at that point. That would make the most sense. First off, right off the bat. If it's an actual test, like you're doing a jump height test, one of the easiest ways to do it is actually just to start rehearsing the conditions of the test. That's the easiest way to kind of cheat some quick gains on a jump score, right? You just start doing the specificity of the actual test. So you might be like rolling your eyes at those two answers, but that's true. Like if you just want to say they on paper that they jumped higher because they did a, you know, like a jump and reach test or they did a, a vert mat te test, you just start doing that. Outside of that, those are like the obvious ones for me. Uh, really something very simple would just be to start incorporating some either um, volleyball specific type jumping. So you can include some like counter movements, some static jumps from like a squat position, some, um, what's it called, where you, uh, there's a word for it, where you run up and kind of mimic doing a spike jump, where you do like a run and jump up on one leg jump. Very, very simple things like that. Generally, they're going to be done at, you know, like 90, 85 to 85% 85 intensity and up, meaning like mostly getting close to maximal effort training. I would also include some maximal strength work in if they're not already doing that. And that should be something that they do 
I would say two times per week, no less than one, certainly. If you're not doing any maximal strength training, then you're, you're mostly already wasting your time. So what that would mean is like doing, you know, some high bar squats for sets of three, you know, like one to three-ish, that would be really good. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things. If they're proficient in the weightlifting movements, that's something that you can include. You can do some pulls from the rack or some pulls from the knee, stuff like that. But after that, it's really just kind of like looking at what the actual jumps that they need to do and starting to rehearse those jumps and working on the technique and then building up the intensity as you go. The thing with power training in this case is it's not quite the same as hypertrophy training where we say increase the volume, increase the volume, increase the volume. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because the sensitivity and fatigue relations is very, very low. So one of the things that you find is that things like power speed ability immediately start going down when the prepared, or excuse me, the preparedness for those things start going down when training volume starts going up. So this is something where you might do two to three sessions per week of dedicated jump training if they're not already doing a lot of volleyball training. If they are doing a lot of volleyball training, I would just get most of their jump training from that. That would be the most economical way of doing it. Mike, did I miss anything? Or did, I, f- I felt like that was kind of vague. I don't know. Did I? No, that's you knocked it out, man. Okay. Yeah. So I think the take on, I, I think Mike is probably going to agree with me on this point. If you have a person who is a professional volleyball player and you want them to be better at jumping, the, the, the immediate problem I would see here is they're only volleyball training once per week. How do you get the most specific volleyball jump training? Well, you go and do volleyball. So, that, I mean, you can add more training sessions, but then it's not a good economical use of your time. So you're adding things that they could just be already doing in the most ecologically valid context possible, which is practicing volleyball, rather than having them come back to the gym for a separate session to work on all these other things. To me, it seems silly. You, the same argument can be made, and most of you have heard me talk about this for conditioning and small-sided games. Why have them come back and do separate conditioning when you can just include some small-sided games into your practice where they get the most contextual conditioning possible with the same benefit? It seems silly. Yep. All right, up next. Just below, uh, Lucas T. Carvalho. Carvalho. This is a quick one. Can you expand on the year-round heavy singles at RP7 and 9 for powerlifters as a way to, one, conserve technique during hypertrophy phases, doing a low bar squat single before the high bar squat volume for the day, and two, judge how heavy you should go for the day during strength phases. Assuming it's not a super heavy single, how would you program them? How many sessions? How many times a week? And at what RP? I think James and I probably both agree that that's just not the best idea in the world. Um, and maybe somebody else is a proponent of them that you had in mind that maybe they can expand on why they do it. We wouldn't be too terribly big fans of it because the benefits of keeping that uh, technique during hypertrophy phase is by no means clear because you don't need it during hypertrophy phase. You're better off putting more resources into hypertrophy. Also, when you get really strong, competition lifting, you need a big break from that because it irritates your connective tissues and joints in a very special way you need to back the fuck up away from. So you're doing high bar squats. A lot of times it's just to save the rest of your body from low bar squats, for example. Um, and also you can always regain your brilliant technique when you come back to the squats later. And actually here's another really interesting thing. Your technique improves more if you take occasional breaks away from doing it at all and come in and rework into it. And it works in every single sport. If you t- train something all the time, you develop a degree of stainless to it. So hypertrophy phase is a perfect example of when to move away from the technique completely. And then when you come back to it, you, you go really well. And also as a good uh, big uh, onus on this is because a powerlifting technique is brutally simple. Like, yeah, if you're a weightlifter, you don't ever want to get away completely from snatches and clean and jerks. You might want to go much lighter. Um, but notice it's also much lighter. Very few weightlifters do like very, very heavy snatch and clean and jerk year round every weekend or whatever, which is not a really good idea because it's all the same chronic injuries and so on and so forth. Secondly, judging how heavy you should go for the day by doing a, a, some kind of RP single, we have a two factor problem there. Factor one is just by no means clear how a low bar single translates to your high bar work. Factor two is you don't, you don't have to do two independent judgments. You have to judge the RPE you think you got on the low bar squad. And that's tough to do when you're not even going to the limit uh, or even close for a single, you know, like, is it a seven or is it an eight? Who knows? And then also like, so there's that error. And then you multiply the error by the error of applying it to the high bar squat. So I would just say that uh, hyper phase is a great time to get away from all competition movements if, uh, for, for, especially for more advanced folks. And then when you enter your strength phase, you start to weave the movements back in. Um, I, if you really, really want to keep in uh, competition movements just for technique, program them just for technique. Do a couple of sets of three to five reps, light, 60 to 70%, 
And that will allow you to have crisp technique and also the weight is low enough and you get enough practice with it that you can rework your technique a little bit. Because like a one single doesn't even hardly let you practice the fucking technique yeah. at all. You don't learn hardly shit from that and it's sure as hell not going to change it for the better. So that's, that's the, the idea on that, James. Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Mike on there. Uh, it's, it's, it's not that I'm not, it's not that I'm against um, maintaining the technique per se. I'm just against doing like the heavy single. Uh, that seems just ridiculous for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think that you can just do dedicated technique work and largely reap the same benefit, even if it's light. Um, if you are wanting to split the difference because you don't like Dr. Mike and my answer there, you could consider uh, like maybe on your last hypertrophy block before transitioning into a strength block that if you have any downsets to do on squats that maybe you could do some of your downsets as low bar and that would help you transition so that when you got to the strength block, you're kind of already revamping your technique. But again, like Mike said, you want some time away from that technique. You want some time away to heal. If you're feeling good and you know that you take a little while to warm up to high bar squats, that's something that you can do. But I do think you can get the same or very close to the same benefit of just keeping some technique work in very light, focusing on the bar position, your hand position, things like that, um, and get just as much out of it. Excellent. Next up is Paul Weisner with an awesome question. Oh, you're a Weisner guy, eh? Yeah, man. Yes, eh? Hi, doctors. Is it a good idea to use periodization for non-physical activities such as studying for the SAT? If so, would you organize it into a content phase as a base, mini quizzes to establish pacing, and then a lot of practice tests uh, as peaking with high specificity? So uh, just to answer generally, periodization works for anything you ever want to improve. The specific way the periodization occurs is, of course, specific to what you want to improve, but it works for everything. It works for sports, it works for dancing, it works for studying. Um, uh, your idea sounds pretty great. Uh, a similar idea I would have is to do three phases, or generally, you know, it's not three distinct phases. It's like, you know, more of the thing that's in quote unquote phase one, less of the other two things, and then it slowly transmutes into more of the middle thing and then more of the last thing. So you start out studying for the SAT with, yeah, you, may, you might even take a, a real SAT test once a week or once every two weeks during that time. But what you mostly do is content, like you said, like learning the stuff the SAT is really gonna be testing you on to make sure you're really brushed up on it. Cause like focusing on how to solve specific geometry problems is not a good idea until you've like reviewed geometry and you're like, oh yeah, angles, right, okay, great. So a lot of content at first, then once your content is getting really caught up, you start to do more of, and you do this anyway, more of focusing on specific styles of questions and strategies to answer them. Because a big part of tests like the SAT is a very, very predictable question style. And they ask you questions in a way that you might think is really, really hard. But then when you read the SAT book, the manual, you're like, oh, I got this question's not that hard. They're just looking for a real specific thing. And I know how to fucking answer that thing because it's, it's pretty obvious at this point. Um, and there's some good strategies to use for specific types of questions. This is also where you can learn where you're weakest and maybe where you can raise your scores the most and or where you're strongest and where you can really do the best, right? But in general, you want to focus on specific strategies for answering kinds of questions, groups of questions, uh, maybe some other stuff like that. Lastly, a part of the phasic structure you would use is more and more competition style work where you do more and more subtests and actual tests uh, to get used to specifically even plenty of longer full tests, that's where the pacing comes in. Because uh, like if you've taken five SATs in the last two weeks before you take the real one, the real one's just another fucking SAT. You've already done really well on it. It's not, you're not going to be surprised by anything. Um, but you can't, as you notice, the pacing, it, it, let's, let's say we try the pacing stuff, like the actual taking the tests first and do a lot of that first. Well, we're going to get stumbled up on these questions that we don't have strategies to answer. Anyway, uh, I don't know how much of that anyone heard, um, but quick review is there's only one. Can you still hear me, James? Mm -hmm. there's, there's really like, if you try to do any of the phases out of order, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. You want a phase where you review your base stuff first, then a phase where you work on uh, different kind of question strategies, and then later you synthesize all of it more so. You mind you, you do all these things the entire time, you just do more of them towards the end in that phasic structure, you get to feel for the actual exam, and that'll probably prepare you for the best. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. You can and take that same idea as Mike said earlier and apply it to almost anything in life. Like first you look at the fundamentals of whatever it is that you're trying to do, whether it's knowledge or movement patterns or any of those things, and just look at what are the basic things that make up this bigger thing that I'm trying to do. And then you start incorporating more and more difficult 
aspects of it. You increase the specificity over time. And that's really just a matter of like kind of dialing up certain aspects of like, okay, I have like content dial here. I have kind of like a transition dial here and I have like a competition style dial here. And I'm just kind of fluctuating those things around. And it's very applicable to a lot of things in life. Next question is from Nick Alvaro. Uh, red or magenta N. He says, good day, docs. We're talking macros. Should you include the protein from vegetables and other indirect protein sources? So there are multiple answers to this. All of them are fine. It's all about consistency. So whatever you choose to do consistently, just keep doing it. What I tend to do um, if I manually track my macros is I just count the calories full in all the stuff. Um, but I count the uh, protein content in veggies and stuff and in complete sources as half because it's really only halfway anabolic uh, with combined with other sources about. Uh, and then that tends to work for me, but you can count it full or you could not count it at all. Just when you don't count it at all, make sure not to extract your calories from your proteins and carbs and fats alone. And then you, you realize that you're like, oh, I'm not eating so many calories, but you're eating a fuckload of just not counting the protein. So make sure you count your calories for what they are. Uh, there is some argument that some of the proteins don't even digest, so you can count them for fewer calories. You don't have to do that, go that crazy. But uh, generally speaking, you can count the proteins for whatever you choose, anything between zero, a tough sell to count it for zero, half, which is a good, good sell, full, which is great because it's simple. Um, any the, three of those is fine. And then make sure to just count the calories for full in most uh, cases. James? Yeah, and like Dr. Mike said, it's mostly a wash over time as long as you do it consistently. The problem that you run into is if you start mixing and matching the vegetable sources or whatever it is, the, whatever ancillary that you're worried about, yeah. and you start using different sources. So let's just say you were like a broccoli man for a long time and you're like, man, fuck this broccoli. I'm so sick of this broccoli. I'm going to switch to like beans and chickpeas, right? Now you have like a very big delta in your ancillaries, which is going to throw off whatever you have been doing for the last x number of months is it going to be massively off no but it is going to be off a little bit and you might have to course correct if you are mostly using the same stuff doesn't matter a ton and as long as you do it consistently pick pick and choose what's the most easy for and practical for you to follow super the phone is ringing so i might get how Yo. dare you how dare you mute me um no i'm just kidding uh the DSL that does this funny thing. If the phone rings, it just boots me off. It's just like, nah, you're done. That's terrible. When yeah. is the shit getting resolved? Well, that's the thing. They keep, uh, it was supposed to be done in like September. And then they were like, oh, June. And then they were like, so then we were like, okay, it's June. And they were like, oh, July, COVID, COVID, July 1st. And then we're calling. And so we call in July and they're like, we don't have any idea when this service is going to be off. Oh my God. They fucking suck. Fuck CenturyLink. Um, who knows? It's a, uh, it's just an infrastructure thing. So they, they have it like pretty close up to our neighborhood. Um, they just have to like connect the lines further down and then connect it to the house. That's, that's literally it. It's just an infrastructure thing. So that once it's connected, done deal. Yeah. Whatever. All right. Let's go to ID Voca. ID Voca. Red. Got it. In a recent Q&A, John Meadows mentioned that muscle protein synthesis lasts about 24 to 48 hours after your training session for non-enhanced lifters. Does that mean your muscle tissue has to be fully recovered during that time span? Personally, I need about four to five days to fully recover after a deadlift session. In the last week of a powerlifting meso, I feel like I was in a very one-sided fight with a school bus. <laughs> Do I need to reduce the volume and intensity to be able to take advantage of the 24 to 48 hour period for muscle protein synthesis? Well, so it's not 24 to 48. It might be longer than that on, on some occasions, maybe up to 72 hours or something like that, perhaps even longer in some, some cases. But generally, muscle, muscle grows for, you know, about two to three days, okay? And not much longer than that, which means that if you train once a week, that's fucking stupid. Um, now, recovery in almost every case lasts longer than how much net positive protein synthesis you get. It's just a fact of the matter that as you get more advanced, your recovery will work on longer time scales. So sometimes you can only recover twice a week, but you're training, uh, you know, but muscle only grows half of that time because you just recovery takes that long. 
So what you definitely want to do is design your program in such a way that stimulates a lot of muscle protein synthesis, but not as an excessive amount of damage that you take way too long to recover. If you're getting just moderately sore and everything's going just fine, and you're training two, at least two times a week, you're in the ballpark, so you're totally good to go. Because if you reduce your volume and intensity a lot, you still might grow muscle for 24 to 48 hours or something, but the total amount of area under the curve, the height of the curve is going to be reduced because you can train as hard. So you might actually grow less muscle if you just try to train really, really easy. So if you're training at least, yeah, I would say generally two to four times per week per muscle group, you're totally fine. And then you really can't train any more often without a huge downside of causing those curves to shrink anyway. So that would be my answer. But definitely don't train like once a week or something. Yeah, and the deadlift specifically is kind of an outlier in terms of a lot of exercises just because the, reto- the recovery time scale is just inherently longer. It's a way bigger amount of muscle mass. It's a way bigger central and peripheral nervous system demand. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much so long as you're training a lot of those other muscles, like Dr. Mike said, two to four times per week. What you might find yourself doing as uh, someone who moves into intermediate advanced stages of power building is having an a kind of a, a non-linear deadlifting schedule where you might only take one or two really hard deadlifts throughout a master cycle and then either light sessions or something else on the other sessions where you would normally deadlift and that's something that you might find really really helpful so you might do like a moderate deadlift week one a hard deadlift week two week three is like a light session deadlift and then week four peak week is like another really hard one and then you go into deload and start over All right, next question is Riley with a black, just a black area. Two questions here, guys. Number one, if the muscle doesn't recognize weight, more so just tension, would it be more, would being more fatigued from work prior to lifting lead to any change in hypertrophy if lighter loads are used, but the intensity is the same? Yes, totally. Because your muscles, be if you're tired from work, you are systemically tired, not just tired in local muscles. And then your local muscles can't produce as much tension uh, because they're capped by systemic fatigue. Uh, And even if they're tired locally, they can't produce as much tension at the local level and thus they don't hypertrophy as much. So being tired sucks because the tension produced by the muscle is lower. And that reflects itself in how much weight you use externally, uh, but it's definitely a thing. Uh, So be less tired is a good idea. And so that I'm totally, totally in agreement, but just to, just to throw your point, a little bone here, if you do find that you are really fatigued from doing something, you're going to be more capped trying to do heavy lifting than you are lighter lifting. So in terms of like a less negative or like a, yeah, like a lesser evil, right. You might choose to do like 10 to 20 or 20 to 30 rep range because it's going to be less inhibited by systemic fatigue than say five to 10 rep range, which is like, you're going to go and do your first couple of warm up sets and be like, <laughs> fuck this. This is stupid. Um, but it's definitely going to, imp- it's, it's definitely going to be an, an, an impediment in terms of how much growth or how productive your training will be. Number two, when comparing a stimulus to fatigue ratio between various exercises, loaded stretch movements always feel best, but does this mean they're actually better due to, the, to their lower loading capabilities? Dumbbell press versus dumbbell fly, dumbbell curl versus incline curl. They're not better because of, because of their low loading capabilities. They're worse because of those. They're better because the loaded stretch is an independent factor of hypertrophy and fucking works really well. Um, so if you can find an exercise which allows a loaded stretch but allows also heavy loading, you really fucking won. Uh, deficit deadlifts are a great one. Um, you know, rows uh, with, you know, with a camber bar or something like that. And a lot of times on like something like dumbbell uh, curl, like, uh, like if you're – uh, inclining or something like that, like you can actually lift a lot like that in incline curl and a dumbbell curl. Sometimes you can standing dumbbell curl, you can dumbbell curl more because of like just leverage advantages and not because your bicep is producing more tension. It actually could be producing as much or more tension beginning from a slightly pre-stretched position, which a lot of times is a really strong position for a muscle to begin with. So there's some real trade off there. So if you begin from such a stretched position or go to such a stretched position that your muscle loses the ability to generate tension, that's poor technique and that's too much. Like if you don't do dumbbell flies so much that your elbows are completely straight and then it's just a bicep workout instead of a pack workout, like that's bad. You went too low. But if you do dumbbell flies with like super partial range of motion, never get the stretch, that's bad. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio checklist, the little proxy guide of how much of a burn, pump, tension, blah, 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 et cetera, you're getting soreness is a really good way to figure out like where that best trade off is. So whatever fucks up your pecs the most in, in some sense and pumps them the most is really where that's better off. And you'll notice that that's somewhere in a compromise between a really good loaded stretch position and still mechanically advantageous enough uh, for you to generate high forces. 
and again, we've, we've mentioned this before, but don't, uh, it's easy to kind of make the ghetto MEV mistake by looking at an exercise, which is an inherently lighter load. So just using the example he gave of DB press versus DB fly. And you might be like, oh, I get like such better pumps and stuff from like DB fly. Why don't I do DB press? Like, it seems like it's better. Well, it's like, it's an inherently lighter weight. So in most cases, not all, you're probably going to have slightly better mind muscle connections, slightly better pumps, things like that. When you're using a weight that's a little bit lighter, just because you can focus on those things a little bit more, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It could be like a false positive in many cases. Um, but hypertrophy training in general is very forgiving in that regard in terms of exercise order, exercise selection. So like Dr. Mike said, you want to find exercises that strike a balance between those things, but also don't just be fooled. Like you got a wicked pump from uh, incline curls. It doesn't mean that DB curls, like standing DB curls are, 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 bad or worse. It just means that that particular movement, the incline curl was good that you were able to, the load was probably lighter and such that you were able to really get a good mind muscle connection, really focus on that movement, get a good squeeze and you got a fucking good pump and burn. And that's, and that's fine. Just be aware that there is that potential to make a, like a type one error when the exercises isn't, when you're comparing two different exercises for the same muscle and one is just inherently lighter than the other one. It's an easy mistake to make. All right. Let's, do one last one because this is the tenth question, and I think James, I've got uh, oh, pretty decent. Oh, I think. Go ahead. I was just, I spotted a name, and I, I, I I'm guessing you're going to gravitate towards the same name. I'm 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 curious. Let me see what you. I'm going to see what you pick, and then see Rubius right. Hagrid. Yes. That's very sweet. Um, the way we're probably going to do this is just scrolling down and finding all of the highest voted comments that appear first. So we'll miss some high voted comments down later and YouTube algorithm doesn't seem to want to bump them, but that's just a limitation of, of what we're doing. So uh, anyway, okay, here's the deal. Final question, I believe. Let me make sure my notes are correct. Yep, final question. So Rubius Hagrid says, asks, are there different kinds of muscle pumps and why do different muscles feel differently when pumped up? For example, the pump in my chest feels different than the pump in my hamstrings where it's fairly painful. It feels very deep in the muscle and is very tight. Sometimes I have different tricep pumps depending on uh, uh, exercise. Sometimes it's a chest pump. Like a chest pump where it feels full, it's gonna burst. Sometimes it feels like a deep, tight tension. Fairly new training around eight months, I just might, might be misinterpreting what a good pump is supposed to feel like in the hamstrings. So my best answer to this is twofold. One, the reason that pumps are differ are different because muscles have different architectures completely and they, uh, they are in a different part of your body. So sometimes muscle press up against other structures. You can really, really feel the pump as like a, a big tension. Um, and sometimes uh, they don't press up on other structures. So it's difficult for you to feel the pump a lot and it might feel a little bit different, a little bit of like a painful thing in a particular area. Uh, all that being said, it's really not, um, it, it doesn't net you, I don't think anything to really focus on exactly what a pump feels like muscle to muscle to muscle comparison. Like your chest pumps and bicep pumps are gonna feel different from each other. It's just different muscle, different location, different architecture, different fiber types, potentially arrangement of uh, muscle fibers. So what ends up happening is what you wanna do is each muscle compare the pump to itself. I guess so like seated leg curl versus lying leg curl, see which one gives you a better pump. And even better comparison is like seated leg curl for sets of 10 versus seated leg curl for sets of 20 or seated leg curl with your feet close together, or seated leg curl with your feet wide together. Then you can start comparing pumps. And honestly, like it's, it's really quite simple. If the pumps are equally sort of like intense, but different, that's okay. You just rank them as equal and then both exercises and whatever seem to be great. But if like one exercise just gives you a fucking better pump than the other, even if they're just slightly different pumps, but one's just like not as impressive, then that exercise that gives you a better pump is probably on average a wiser choice to use if you have only the pump to narrow them down. And there's other ways you can choose exercises, many other ways. But like if you, it's just one of these things where if someone's like they do a dumbbell press, like the way you tell them for the chest and you do like five sets, you know, to failure. Do you have a pump? And they're like, not really. And you do some other thing, barbell press, some incline press or something, and do five sets to failure. They're like, what kind of pump do you have? Like, dude, I'm dying. Like my chest, my chest is gonna blow up spaghetti style into my face. I mean, you know, I wouldn't really bet that that, that exercise, the dumbbell press, the first exercise that doesn't give you a pump, I just wouldn't bet my money on it, causing a whole lot more hypertrophy than the exercise that does give you a big pump. So I would put my cards into that and do it a little bit more often. So that, that's my best answer, James. Yeah, that was really good. And um, specifically with the hamstrings, like you brought up in the question, that's a tough one for me to like, because there's, 
I don't know if you feel the same way, Dr. Mike, but um, like for me, the only way I get a pump in my hamstrings is if I do lying leg curls. That's it, period. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other good hamstring options because like doing a 45 degree back raise, good mornings, stiff legged deadlifts, those will fuck my world up uh, like nothing else. But I can't really honestly say I get a good pump during those. It's something where I feel it and I know they're stretched. I know they're working and they feel disrupted. But uh, do I feel pumped like doing an S stiff like a deadlift? Not really. Even a 45 degree back raise for like 15 reps. Do I feel pumped? Not really. The only time I'll get that on the hamstrings is if you're doing like a more knee flexion heavy exercise. So I wouldn't sweat this specific instance too much so long as you're following the other SFR guidelines. Like Dr. Mike said, like there's other ways to assess whether or not that exercise is good for you. The pump is one of them, but there are others you can also look at. Boom. That's it. I think that's it, James. All right, folks. That was pretty good. There was some fun ones. I was kind of worried that we were going to be on like, because I've been, I don't know do you, if, you, have you, if you feel this way, but like um, right now it feels like RIR is what Minicut was like a year and a half to two years ago, where it was like yes. Minicut questions, Minicut questions. And now it's just like RIR, RIR, RIR. And I'm kind yes. of like hoping it doesn't go that route. But it was good. We had a good, good variety of questions and good things to think about. And uh, this is a fun exercise that we've been doing this for years now. And I've always enjoyed this because it does keep you sharp where you have to, sometimes you get something out of left field and you're like, Oh, I have to got to think about it a little bit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. All right. So folks, well done with questions, especially those of you adjusting to the new format. We really appreciate you sticking with us and continuing to engage with us. Make sure you guys subscribe to the RP YouTube channel. There's going to be all sorts of fun stuff coming up. If you guys haven't seen, Dr. Mike does a ton of like uh, fix your fix insert exercise videos. And there's all sorts of fun guests that he has on there. I know we're working with maybe uh, having Spencer do some videos. Of course, I'm going to do some videos. We've got tons of stuff coming on the RP YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe. That way you get to see all the videos when they come out and keep engaging with us. We really appreciate it. 100%. See All right, guys. you guys later next time.